of Indian Affairs will announce his decision on the Milwaukee Trust controversy sometime soon. John Muir, America's most famous naturalist, was born 150 years ago this week. Muir's Scottish immigrant family came to Wisconsin when he was a boy. He went on to become America's foremost environmental leader and the father of our national park system. Muir is associated most with the California wilderness, but he grew up on a Wisconsin farm, and that is where we travel next. John Muir Remembered, photographed by Tom Turnquist and edited by Bruce Johnson. This is the American landscape naturalist John Muir first knew. Not the giant redwoods or majestic mountains of California he would later discover, but a quiet piece of Wisconsin prairie. Here he could watch geese fill the sky. He could listen to the call of sandhill cranes. And here he could watch the unfolding of spring. Oh, that glorious Wisconsin wilderness, wrote Muir of his boyhood days. Everything new and pure in the very prime of spring when nature's pulses were beating highest. As John walked in the valley, he gazed on rocks that seemed to, to glow with their own life. 150 years after his birth, the life of John Muir is being commemorated, even celebrated on stage. Yet the flesh and blood John Muir, like the land he loved, still holds many mysteries. His personal papers were kept secret for 60 years after his death in 1914, and a debate over whether Muir was a draft evader during the Civil War still lingers. Perhaps the man who is honored today as the father of our national park system can best be understood by traveling to the place where he first understood the world, his Wisconsin home. John Muir was 11 years old when he came to this country from Scotland. His family settled on a sandy stretch of Wisconsin prairie near Portage. Like all pioneer families, the Muirs burned back the prairie to clear it for cultivation. Wrote to Muir, I was first put to burning brush and clearing land for the plow. Those magnificent brush fires with great white hearts and red flames. The first big wild outdoor fires I'd ever seen. But it was the beauty of the meadow and lake nearby that inspired the young naturalist most. Landscape architect and current Muir homestead owner, Eric Brenaldson as a boy naturalist, it couldn't, he couldn't have picked a better place. This is really a naturalist's uh, treasure. The original Muir farmhouse disappeared long ago. Today, Brynaldson has carefully rebuilt on the same site, and he is busy trying to preserve the land Muir first loved. Where we're walking through now, is this the, the meadow that Muir writes about in my boyhood and youth? This is Muir's now famous garden meadow. It's also the, the birthplace of an idea, Dave, called the uh, National Park System. This is the Years later, so before his fight to save the redwoods, this would be the land Muir would first seek to preserve. This was where, wrote biographer Lenny Marshwolf, the National Park idea had its first small beginnings. Eric Brynaldson. Muir was really um, our pioneer figure in uh, recognizing the need for uh, preserving um, large expanses of natural and native American landscape. I don't believe it is too grandiose to, uh, to call him the father of the national park system. Again, the words of John Muir. Our beautiful lake is fed by about 20 or 30 meadow springs. It's surrounded by finely modeled hills dotted with oak and hickory and meadows full of grasses and sedges. On bright days, when the lake was rippled by a breeze, the lilies and sun spangles danced together in radiant beauty. Muir did uh, feel that it was uh, beyond just uh, ma you know majestic uh, snow-capped peaks and and uh, landscapes of that scale that uh, a sedge meadow uh, such as this one uh, was just as important in terms of uh, landscape diversity. 
Muir's own life was a lesson in the value of diversity. As a teenager, he dreamed up, drew, and then whittled countless inventions. He was fascinated by time and clocks, and he took some of his more intriguing contraptions to the 1860 State Fair in Madison, where they created a clamor. Now past the age of 21, Muir decided it was finally time to head for the university. Eric Brenaldson. John Muir, by the time uh, he went off to the university, was literally starving for stimulation. He, uh, he quickly uh, uh, became uh, what, what early faculty uh, called uh, a genius, and people would, would uh, uh, come especially uh, to his dorm room in North Hall to, to visit him and that sort of thing. In North Hall, Muir assembled his famous automatic study desk, a desk that actor Garth Gilchrist describes in his one-man show on the life of John Muir. And this desk, once you sat down in it, it would automatically place a book in front of you and open it up to a particular page and you'd be allowed to read. And then abruptly, the book would be snapshot, drawn away, rotated over, and another book put in its place and opened up. And likewise, you would read in this book, and then it would be snapshot, drawn away, rotated over, and still another put down and opened up, on and on and on, as many books as you put in the machine. Now, in this way, John felt that he could guarantee himself a balanced education. <laughs> but John's education at North Hall was haunted by the lengthening shadow of the Civil War. At nearby Camp Randall, Muir saw the wounded die. In letters home, he called it the whole abominable business a business many Muir historians now believe led him to leave the university and the country. He uh, couldn't possibly imagine uh, killing his own species uh, for any reason. And, of course, that's how he felt about uh, anything uh, living in general. So, yes, he did, uh, he did uh, go for Can head for Canada uh, as a statement against the Civil War. Muir left the university for what he called the University of the Wilderness, a lifelong journey that took him to Canada, South America, and the High Sierra. There he sketched the shape of the California wilderness, led the fight to protect the redwoods and preserve Yosemite Valley. Muir found fame and disappointment in California. He saved Yosemite, but lost Hetch Hetchy. Hetch Hetchy was a valley dam to provide drinking water for the growing city of San Francisco. This simple sketch is all that remains of Hetch Hetchy, a valley Muir considered as beautiful as any. Lost, and, and most of the biographers, I'm sure, would agree that uh, Hetch Hetchy shortened Muir's life a great deal. And uh, it's interesting that now before us, again in this 150th year, there's a uh, proposal by the Secretary of Interior, Donald Hodel, to blow out the O'Shaughnessy Dam and restore Hetch Hetchy Valley back to its original state. And I think that's a The reclamation of Hetch Hetchy is far from certain. Far from certain as well as the future of the original Muir homestead, Fountain Lake Farm. Yeah. Today, the Muir land is being burned again, not to create a farm this time, but to recreate the prairie that was once there. Eventually, Eric Brenaldson and others want the prairie farm to become an historic site, part of what Muir created, the National Park System. I think that uh, the Fountain Lake Farm and the adjoining environs uh, represent uh, the place that's most fundamental to uh, the uh, evolution of the father of our national parks, John Muir. There's just a feeling in the wind around here uh, that, that Muir is somehow, his philosophy at least, is alive and well. And I do feel that uh, John Muir's spirit somehow hovers over this place. Shortly before his death, Muir wrote of his boyhood Wisconsin home for the last time. Even if I should never see it again, the beauty of its lilies and orchids is so pressed into my mind that I shall always enjoy looking back at them in imagination. This week, the Supreme Court ruled by a 4-3 vote that the Veterans Administration, when making decisions about educational benefits, may view alcoholism as willful misconduct rather than a disease. The case came about when two